Welcome everyone, it's Bible study time, yay! Super, super excited about coming forward today, y'all. Uh, we have reached a milestone, you guys. We actually have completed the entire Old Testament. Of course, there are some <clears throat> books that I have not made mention to, like Malachi and Micah and uh, Ezra, and some of the smaller books, Ob Obadiah, um, but the overall theme of what has happened and transpired within the Old Testament, we have covered. So today, I'm just thinking of, you know, this as a celebratory Bible study to celebrate and to highlight some of the key perspectives that we really need to take away from the Old Testament, okay? Because what we're approaching, you guys, is... 400 years of God going silent, complete, completely silent amongst the people. God doesn't uh, have any prophets amongst the people that he's prophesying to. God has no uh, communications with anyone. God's angels are not communicating themselves amongst the people as uh, that God had ordained them to do, uh, to go fetch people and, and tell them to go do things. He's not doing any of that. Kind of like what's going on today. That's exactly how life is today. You don't hear of anyone saying that an angel of God came upon me and told me to do this. Of course, you know, if they did, they'd probably be uh, put in a, you know, some sort of a mental health treatment program. But you don't even hear anyone in your community saying, you know what, I you look, you've known me since I was a child. My family can vouch for me. I am not crazy. The angel of God came to me and told me this, that, and the other. You never hear it. You, you, you never hear it. Any of our, in, in none of our leaders, none of our leaders that are leading the children, political leaders, any of our leaders that are pronounced, uh, you know, stage-worthy leaders that really have the attention of the masses, none of them have been approached by None of them have communicated that they've been approached by any ambassador of God, a representative of God in an angelic form, informing them to go and to do certain things in the earth. Even in, you know, your lower, lower uh, socioeconomical communities, you don't hear of anyone saying, you know what, an angel or a spirit came upon me and told me to go tell these people to do this thing. Because let me tell you, friend, all that we have read amongst these children and all of their travels are amongst nations, but they are amongst regular people. These people that these children are moving through and even these children themselves are regular people. These children have been at the height where they have had land, had vast treasures that they could uh, uh, d break up and uh, disperse amongst one another. And they have felt what it feels like to be impoverished and to lose all of which they gained and to still have to stand in front of the nations that know their whole history. So when God was moving through the children, God was moving through these children when they were in poverty. God said himself, I am a God that walks in tents. I don't need to walk in a palace. I walk with you in the low places. So you don't hear anyone speaking. Not even in the, the ghettos of America, in the ghettos of, of other countries, or in the lower income areas or the mid income areas or even in the high income areas. You don't hear of anyone saying that an angel actually came upon me, an angel of God came upon me and told me to do this, that, and the other. Now that doesn't mean that angels are not abound. I'm not speaking that to you at all. I'm not saying that an angel, that you may not be entertaining angels at any given time. 
because from what is communicated in the, in the text, in the, using Gideon as an example, when the angel of God came upon Gideon, he didn't even believe it. He had to make sure that the person was who he said he was. Because as it is today and as it has been throughout all of time, human nature is human nature. You have people that will misrepresent themselves to gain, to gain power in the world. So once the word got out that God had sent angels and, and word got out as to what they look like and they look like us, then that opened the door for anyone to impose themselves as an angel and lead people astray for financial gain or for whatever reason they chose to do that. But I brought that up to tell you that you don't hear anyone speaking of these things and it wasn't as if the angel looked outside any, in, in any way, shape, or form uh, different than the people that they came amongst. So, God is going in stealth mode. The Old Testament, from what we have gathered throughout this entire book of the Old Testament, what I've gathered is that this was really kindergarten for these children. What happened within the Adam and Eve story when they made uh, the decision to compromise themselves and they fell uh, within their own hierarchy. They fell. They lost the covering that they had and they had to take on another covering. They were, they were displaced. They were taken from one space that they were residing in, a heavenly paradise, secure, safe, powerful space to a demoted space uh, uh they they fell and they, they and they and they ended up having to leave that safety and they ended up having to take on another cloak uh and 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 forfeit their uh, ethereal cloak their spiritual cloak and to swap it out for a physical cloak and then walk and find new residency within the world as a whole in the earth. From that instance of what they did, that, that, that decision that they all made, regardless of who you're gonna paint the, who you're gonna blame, who you're gonna point the finger to, that decision corrupted everyone that came behind both Adam and Eve, everyone. And this is the whole theory of you're born into sin. And because of that, it changed the dynamic between God and us. The dynamic prior to Adam and Eve, there really is not a lot written to it as to what that dynamic was. What type of God was God before the fall? You know, I have not gotten any real tangible communications as to that. I can only use my imagination. But we do know what type of God emerges after the fall. And this God is a God that is imposing fear. This God is a God that is a cause and effect God. There is a punishment. I have to punish you. Even though I don't want to, I have to. Because now you have done something that you, can, you, you can't undo. You've changed the structure of our relationship. And because of that, I have to put you on a micromanagement plan. I'm going to have to micromanage you, kind of nurse you at this point, um, and enforce my rules upon you in a fearful state for you to respect me and to you, for you to adhere to the rules. Because before... I, I, I could not have been as uh, imposing upon you because if I had, you wouldn't have had the wiggle room to make the decisions you did. Neither would those that came upon you and provoked you to make those decisions. See, God didn't just begin to micromanage us, his children. God micromanaged everybody. From the shaitans, to the serpents, to everyone, because they had completely gotten out of hand. I told you before, they had opened portals up and they were letting other spirits in. Friend, if you think that Satan 
and the jinns or Satan's and his demons are the only problem we have in this realm, you are really misinformed. There are many spirits here that are trapped here because God closed the realms up and, and, and sealed them. And some are bound and some are not until a time. So the children, because of their decision, has really been in a multiplied type of transgressory state where all of their transgressions are just multiplied one after the next, after the next. The more that they walk, whether from out of the Garden of Eden or out of Egypt or through the wilderness, the more that they walk, the more they transgress, the more people are setting snares for them to trip up and to fall, traps for them to fall into. Even themselves, they've gotten so enamored with all of the tricks of the enemy, all of the sparkly bright things, all of the creations that they have forgotten the creator. They've forgotten the basics to this. And this is why God had to be as stern as he was in all of their travels with these children and with the nations. A lot that's going on, I told you, after Adam and Eve, then, you know, they leave and, and, and God decides that he's going to flood the world to try to salvage what he could and reset it as much as he possibly could out of love. So it's fair for everyone because it had gotten to a point where it wasn't fair for everyone. It wasn't fair for those that were holding on to the righteousness they were the minority and they were overwhelmed by the wickedness of all of those that had been gone led astray. And God said, I'm going to reset it. I'm actually going to destroy it. And I got a plan. But the, the serpent, the opponent, the shaitans, the jinns, all of these entities, they are relentless because they have just as much vested as we do. It is a battle of wills, y'all. This is the will battle. This is not, this is no joke. And they make you, the, the opponent, your opponent is making it look like it's a joke to you. He wants you to not take it seriously. So you can play around with it. And the more you play around with it, the, the stronger he gets. So God floods the world. He resets it. No one's alive but Noah, his descendants, the animals, and what is in the water. I just told you in the last video I did on my podcast about the jinn. God condemned them to the sea. Now, could that condemn, condemnation have come in the form of the flood? I don't really know all of the specifics of it, but they have been condemned to the sea. So they transformed their existence. They fell into the hierarchy of things. They fell. They were once land beings prior to the flood. They were predominant all throughout the world. Miraculous things had happened between them and us. Miraculous things on this planet. A lot of the monuments you see along the, the, across the planet are representations of that. And God said, I'm going to reset everything. I'm going to flood it. And I'm going to leave Noah and his descendants to repopulate the land. And I'm going to leave these uh, uh, Shaitan and his descendants, uh, not descendants, his brethren and sistren, his army into the sea. And, and I'm going to tell them not to commune with one another. That could be a metaphor to, you know, land and sea having a, uh, a division between the two. When you look at Paul in Revelation, the first, I want to say the first chapter of Revelation, the first sentence, the first verse, I can't recall, but it's, it's right there in the beginning of Revelation. What does it say? Let me go to it since we're here. It says here, 
while he is in the Isle of Patmos. It says, <sighs> John, it was not Paul, it was John, John. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom of Jesus, the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the Isle of Patmos for the word of God. Um, nonetheless, I can't find it, you guys. I, it just came upon me. I wasn't prepared to, to speak to it. But none the, nonetheless, he's speaking to him having one foot on the land and one foot in the sea. When I speak to King Solomon, the great God's God's most beloved, King Solomon is saying he's giving he's been given uh permission by God to use these demons to build the temple of Jerusalem. When Job is being tested, Job, the book, the oldest book of the Bible. When Job is being tested, prior to Job being tested, isn't it God and Satan speaking to one another as if they're brethren? There is no dissension. There is no war. Everything has an order and a place to it. The problem is that many of us do not know our role. And many of the children in this book that are traveling throughout all of these many walks have lost the the fundamentals to what their role is. They're just wandering. They fall for all of the snares and the traps because they do not have a strong identity. They don't have a strong sense of self. They do not know the power of the God that is within them, nor do they know the rules of staying in alignment to that God, nor do they know how to tap into that energy in its fullness execute it and make all that is within this garden bow to them. They've forgotten it. And everything that they do, no matter how much they move forward, it only leads them further into um, ignorance of it. From generation to generation. Period. Period. To the point that they get that, that they're they're sold on the concepts of these other nations. And they've forgotten the name of their own father. They've forgotten the power that is only for their house and for them. These laws that God has bestowed these children to follow are not for these nations. These children are warring with these people. They are exterminating people. They're exterminating whole nations of people. We've gone through this whole first book of the Bible, the Old Testament. This is what God is saying. And if they would have done exactly what God would have done, they wouldn't have any enemies. But just as the Midianites that sat their women in front of them, these exotic women, these different, when I say exotic, I mean exotic, I mean different women from their own community of people. They became enamored with them because it was something different. And they they, they were sold on it. And they began bowing to what these people believed in. And, and now the women were the entryway. And, and then once the women entered, then now their brothers and cousins and uncles and all of them can come and they'll commune with them. And now they're friends. They become friends. And before you know it, Israel is over here doing stuff that the Midians are doing. They're honoring gods that the Midians are honoring. They're allowing things in to their system, their spiritual system, their temple that the Midians do, which are not of their house. And this was the problem. And this is still our problem. The whole world has this problem, friend. Isn't it amazing how the whole world has this problem?
in the you know in our walk into the new testament we're going to start experiencing some contrast the god of the new testament is the same god of the old testament however time has passed and the god of the old testament has done his due diligence in establishing laws and rules and micromanaging these children, walking these children hand in hand through their experiences. It's kind of like riding a bike. God is God is the dad and you're the little kid on the bike and he's showing you how to ride that bike. He's walking you with you. That's what he's doing in the Old Testament. And now he's going to go silent. And he's going to see what these children do. He already knows what they're going to do. They just need to do it. Because it's just like life for us. We, we can know something from the way we were raised. And then when we get out into the world, our parents don't call us every night to make sure we did this and did that and you know, did you did you uh, brush your teeth and wash your face? Did you did you cook breakfast? Did you do? You, they don't they don't call and ask all of that. It's supposed to be programmed into you at this point, and that's exactly what's happening with God. All of this stuff is programmed; it should be programmed into these children. Surely things will come that will. Take them outside of this program, you know, because the enemy is going. The enemy is going to be prevalent. Period, friend. God needs to know that these children are resourceful, relentless. So even if they, even if they default away from what they were programmed to do for a for a while, a season, because they're going through something and trying to uh, come to terms with it. That they default back. They gotta, they gotta get in the rhythm of fighting for it. They gotta get in the rhythm of wrestling with it. They gotta really want it. Now that you know the rules, I don't have to spell it all out to you. You know the history. I, all of our prophets have come before you and hammered it in. Hezekiah and Isaiah reestablished the covenant. We now know the law. It's the second time. I'm, I'm going to go silent now. I know how you're going to do it. Because I wrote this from the end. This has already been written. But I need you to walk it. For you to realize it. It's not about me realizing. This is God saying. It's not about me realizing it because I already know it. I know all of this. This is my this is my scenario. This is my um all of this is mine, my creation. But I created it for you to realize it. Because obviously there's a bigger plan for us. God could not have created us and had us walk through our ancestors and all of those that have come before us, walk through all that we have walked through, regardless to the mistakes. God knows that we're not going to be here making all the right decisions all the time. There are going to be situations that populate themselves. They must come. That will turn us, that will change the trajectory of things, that will change his activities towards us. But we have to have the desire enough built in us to keep coming back at it. Though you slay me, okay, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to take that hit. But I'm coming back. I don't care if I got to grab you by the ankles. You're going to drag me. But I'm going to come back. And that is what God wants in us. Tenacity. Resourcefulness. What is your get back? And God goes quiet. After the whole Jonah situation, 
That was really the most paramount thing coming to the end of the Old Testament when Jonah himself, a prophet, came and God said, go and, and, and do this work for me. And Jonah tries to run because he doesn't want to do the will of God. He doesn't want to go amongst these children. He already knows what the, he knows his brethren and sisters. It takes a special kind friend to deal with these children. I'm telling you. Jonah said, I don't want to be bothered. He hops on a boat. And sleeping like the ba a baby, the boat is rocking. And Jonah knows the nature of God. He says, okay, I know all of the tricks. You're going you're gonna to do all this kind of stuff, but you're not going to destroy this boat. Because why else would he be asleep like that? It had gotten to that point. They were taking God as a joke. They learned him, his nature, through his history, his activities, and they were taking it for granted. That's why I told you, God goes by many names, friend. In the, when, God, when all of this, the dust is settled, all of us are going to be really surprised. It's going to be very surprising. And God comes and he, 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 he makes a, he, Jonah decides he's going to, he don't have a choice. He's going to do the will of God because that's how it is. You don't have a choice. All this ye are God's thing, which Jesus does speak to. And we're going to get into that in the New Testament. You have all of the qualities to be a God and you were ordained to have that. That was your making from the beginning. Little bitty mini God. But you made a left turn. And now you're off in the wilderness. You still have the makings in you. But you don't have that sprinkle. God ain't sprinkled it and activated it in you. So you are, you are potential gods. You got the potential within you because you are of the father and the mother. You are a child of God. But you're not active. There's no, you don't have the qualities by yourself to activate that. You need the life force, the God force that is within you to make that thing manifest. And that is what should humble you. But we've forgotten our role to the point that we don't, we feel like we're too big to humble ourselves to that. Why should I humble myself to this spirit of God within me? And you listen to the shaitans and all of the rest of the devils and you see their manifestations and, and it makes sense to you. And it says, well, you know what? They're able to do it. That is the, that is the prince of this world. I'm going to do it how they do it. When they were here to serve you, that is their goal. Their job is to serve you like they serve Solomon. And Solomon was still able to keep his graces of God. God commanded them and gave him a seal. He gave Solomon the wisdom in which he could com command them. And then covered Solomon with his attention and with his angels to keep him in check. Because let me tell you something, friend. They real smart. It'll look good in the beginning. And it turns into hell on you. And in the end, you're left holding the bag for a small amount of time of luxury. That's how it works. This life is, is, is not a long time. These people that were in this book lived hundreds of years. When you look at Abraham, when you look at Moses, when you look at Jacob, even Jacob was didn't live a whole long time. He lived like 120 years. But when you look at Abraham and Noah, these people live in eight, nine hundred years. We don't live that long. There's no way we can figure this whole thing out in the short amount of time that we're here. Yet all of these demons and these, these, the shaitans, they live thousands of years. And their systems are just like ours. We're ending the Old Testament, and I'm going to get back to Jonah when I was on that. 
And when Jonah was on the ship and he he made a, a pact with God, an agreement, and he said, okay, I'm going to do it. He gets put in the belly of the fish and, and, and spit out. And now he's on his way to Nineveh. But he's got the wrong spirit. I keep telling you, the more these children advance in their walk, the more they lose sight of the fundamentals. He's got the wrong spirit from the gate. He didn't want to do it. He had the nerve to try to run away as if God was going to be discouraged. He's manipulating the aspects of God, showing God, I know your aspects. I'm going to get on this boat because I think I'm going to be safe because you ain't going to do nothing to these people on this boat. That, that shows God, you know me. You've heard about me. And you want to use it against me? The love that I've had for you and all of your 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 ans all of your ancestors and all of your brothers and sisters, you're using that love against me. You're trying to hold me hostage to it. You're giving me an ultimatum. And then he decides, okay, when he gets put in that compromised situation, he said, okay. I'm going to go on over here to Nineveh. But he's made up in his mind that he's going into Nineveh like an all-star. He's a superstar. He walking into Nineveh with his staff and he's boom. Boom. The Lord God of Israel said, you better, you got 40 days to get it together. God sent me. And if you don't get it together, God is going to curse the land and whatever, whatever, whatever. And the people immediately take it upon themselves to repent. That shows me, and I'm sure it shows God, because if I can see it, I know God sees it, that they didn't even know that they were out of alignment. All of them had fallen so low. They didn't even know that they were not doing the right thing. Had they, had they knew that they were doing the wrong thing, I don't think all of them would have been in agreement in repenting. And if they would have got some pushback from one another because they would have gotten enamored in the comforts of doing the wrong thing. Because the wrong thing is always comfortable, friend. It's always easy to do. It's hard to do the right thing. And they adhered so much that word got to the king and the king fell in alignment too without an argument, without anything. And what does Jonah do? Jonah goes outside to other, 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 other city and pouts. He's frustrated. God goes silent. God has gone silent. We're going to be beginning uh, Matthew next week. I'm, I'm super excited about it. You know, I haven't read the New Testament in some years. So this will be n not new for me, but this will be a refresher for me. Um, but I, I love the New Testament. It's an uplifting book. It's a high level book because the Old Testament, friend, coming through the Old Testament, it, it, it was, I don't want to say it was depressing. It, it was depressing. I wanted to come forward each week with some positivity to convey, and I just couldn't find it. Because it wasn't the season for that. But now these children, they have their training wheels off. And God is letting them do what they got to do. They got to figure it out themselves. Actually, they, 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 they've got training wheels on and God is taking his hands off and God is letting them figure it out for themselves with their training wheels on. And Jesus comes and he conveys, a, he comes like a cool breeze in the middle of the day, friend. Jesus comes like a refreshing wind. And I'm very excited. I ask God to use me and to communicate to me his truth of 
this new book because there are so many powerful points of interest within the New Testament. And um, I just want to do the righteous thing in representing them to you. That's my Bible study for you today. Your love more than you'll ever know. I'll never, ever stop telling y'all this. I come in peace and I come in love. But most importantly, I come in truth. Be good to yourselves and be good to each other. Peace and love.